that, and um, there's typically quite a lot of access equipment aggregating, uh, terminating sessions, uh, aggregating it, doing some basic admission control before it hits a router blade that takes a uh, gigabit. So um, if you look at a, the at a ratio, I don't know what the right answer would be, but there'll be a few of those compared to a lot of the transport here. Now you say you're counting every single one. Could you do some type of optimization and somehow get 10 flows in that are identical and then just do away nine and then say it's 10, it's 10? It's yeah, 10, a lot 10. of this is configurable. And, and in fact, if there are a lot of flows that you don't even care about. You don't have to look at all of them in depth. Um, and for some of them, you just want to monitor um, statistics. Again, you can sample. Um, but a lot of the hard work is when a session gets started. Because then you have to figure out what it is, what it's trying to do. Once that's done, and the connection is established, and the data is flowing, then monitoring the data feed, that's all hard work. So on their short connections is what would kill you. A lot of short, short connections would be uh, the most stressful. So the point-to-point, -point, which have very long duration connections, are pretty good for you. Yes and no, because a lot of those protocols have very short setups and then a different connection for data. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of those, and initially some of them were really badly designed. And so um, there was um, the first generation of, even Kaza, I think, it was Fastnet or whatever. Um, what they did was every, uh, uh, periodically send up an update message so that all peers still knew who all the other peers were. And th there wasn't that much peer, peer traffic, but that periodic boom of sync messages would bring the network down. Mm. Um, so there's, there's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, I'll skip those. Conceptually, it means instead of working your way bottom up, um, you want to conceptualize and then compile down. Um, and then some, some, I just brought in a few snippets of what this code looks like, the language looks like. So this is the amount of code it would take. This is when I speak, said, first time in the day you come in to the network, you're trying to go somewhere for content, and it depends how you want to limit this. Um, you get redirected to the ISP's portal, which says, welcome, uh, here's today's office or whatever. And then next time, you just go through. And the way this is done, by the way, is we recognize this flow, we intervene, and you're trying to get to CNN.com, and we change the flow destination to go to ISP.com. And um, from a user perspective, it's transparent. From the network, we just hijack your flow. Um, we can do this for movies, for games. It's, it's a way in free day to say, Sometimes, uh, advice of charge. You only have three more minutes. Do you want to buy more, press here, or do you want to just keep going, press here to continue? Um, could be used for a lot of things. Um, another example is in one case where there was some, some need to uh, do some kind of uh, uh, control on which sites you could go into. And it's not very difficult, but we wrote it in C++ and it was like hundreds of lines. The equivalent in SML was um, yeah. Now, when you compile this, high level abstraction. Yeah. yeah. When you compile because it already assumes it knows what a flow is. It knows what. Um, you compile it, it, it will break down into millions of lines. So we have this whole development environment, and there's the control tools. Um, but at, at this level, and there's templates and libraries, just like there is for C++ and Java. So you have to create this all every time uh, from scratch. But then you have this built-in editor, compiler, uh, integrated environment. Um, the compiler compiles into this intermediate representation, which is a fairly complex graph on which um, we run optimizations. Um, and then the back end could either, we, we've wrote, written two back ends. Um, one is that compiles into our hardware, which scales. The other is for pay, plain Pentium. Wow. Works the same, uh, fraction of the performance, but if you want to use this at the enterprise or... At, and, and you could write backends for other network devices. And what's the ratio of performance? Um, one to ten. Is it? Yeah. 
one, sometimes even more. Yeah. But but, um, but for, for some places, you don't need a lot. Um, for some um, applications, um, you don't need to look at all the flows. You just want to do something for voice over IP. So compile this to a machine that just looks at the voice over IP. But yeah. over time, the Intel processor is getting faster and faster and faster. Um, those processors are leveraged in our architecture for all their general purpose stuff. But if you look at the specialized tasks that you need to do, um, general purpose has a lot of overhead. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I.O. that matters, not CPU. Yeah. yeah. I.O. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. CPU is almost... And then what's the... Macintosh. OS, Linux? <laughs> um, we use VXWorks. Everybody doesn't really understand it. It's uh, Intel, I can tell you. It's nothing it's not specific in VXWorks that we need to be Linux. So, so you said you, you don't, you're you not monitoring the flows like at the uh, VSLAM level. And in typical carrier architecture, you have a, a broadband remote access, uh, right. an aggregator. Uh, those bandwidths tend to be 10, 20, or even 40 gig capacity. So it sounds like you need several service engines for each of those aggregators. Um, yes. The, the, the 40 gigabit is typically not, um, uh, we don't see a lot of 10 gig um, Ethernet type connections or OC192 at the edge. That's deeper in the core. So you'll have a lot of disparate um, connections that aggregate into a gig link or OC48 which will then run to our box. And um, a lot of those physical connections, while they may have 40 of them, are not really heavily utilized. So often you can aggregate several of them into one box. Um, and then um, this is something you could use next to the this one. In fact, we are. Um, it's small enough, it can create some local service interaction. So you, you need to have redirected traffic from an IP flow that once you get to conversion to an ATM, like you're out of the picture. Um, our, our bet was that IP is the game, so we stayed away from ATM. It's not impossible to do, but um, and I think it was a good bet. So the, the, where this becomes interesting around the VSLAM is for IP-enabled VSLAMs. And if you look at the big vendors, um, Alcatel, um, Lucent, um, UP Starcom, they're all putting IP into the VSLAM because Growth of just pure VSLAM ports is not that huge. But anymore. transferring to the user, it's all encapsulated in ATM in many cases um, anyway. In many cases, what they want to do is to have local <coughs> content at the central office. And coming off the VSLAM, you get surface content, and it's perfect quality because you don't have to go anywhere to get it. But they still need something to control access to this content, meter it, and monetize it. So it sounds like you need to be closer to the VSLAM than to the aggregate. Um, for this kind of service, yes. Uh, some put the, the content next to the aggregation device. Right? We sit next to the aggregator. Right? And I think um, most likely a lot of those IP connections from the VSLAMs will be aggregated over a metro Ethernet infrastructure, which is going to be very cheap. And that's going to throw ATM out the door. Um, so again, I think we're almost done. Um, this is so the um, development environment compiler, debugger, profiler. Um, it's actually pretty cool. You can debug. Yeah. You can you can record a traffic, real traffic on your link, run it through a simulator, um, debug your service logic, put a breakpoint on certain types of packets or events and see what happens. Um, yeah. I just want to know who invented SNL. <laughs> yeah, they did. Um, you guys did? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't. Yeah. It, it's part of what we had to create to, for this whole thing to work. In terms of performance, um, it's typically when you want flexibility or performance. It was really hard to say, yes, just both. You, you can't give up performance because at the aggregation point, there's going to be a lot of traffic. And um, at the same time, without flexibility, this thing's going to be a dead. So um, that's been done. What kind of technology did you uh, use to write your compiler? Is that uh, Yak or C or what? Um, yeah, so parts of it is um, C, parts of it are Java, and Yak and stuff like that. You use always for the... Yeah, but um, we've created this mechanism where you can mix SML with Java or C++. So you have, you have callbacks and you can write your own generic... Um, mm -hmm. So just the last two slides where we think this will go next. Um, so 
we assume once there's an intelligent device in the network, once it's already doing all the heavy lifting for profiling the traffic by application, by flow, by session, uh, and reporting all the application level events, um, I showed how if we report this into the billing system, you can do a usage-based billing model. But you can report this into a lot of different systems that all have some clever way of doing something, but have no network hardware capability to scale it into a carrier's network. So you can do intrusion detection, fraud detection, parental control, denial of service. Um, all needs a little bit of know-how, somebody who that's his game. Um, and the box will be able to provide a sequence of events to an intrusion detection system. And the IDS would look at the pattern of events and say, does this look like an intrusion, yes or no? Most of those IDS guys, it's just software for them to, to get into the network, so it'll be hard. Yeah? Yes, do you have an external API yet for your box? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the, the two areas where we started looking at more closely is spam control and some of the denial of service. Uh, there's also the issue of the digital rights management and how do you create a, a legitimate content swapping environment where you can actually track what's being swapped and have the copyright owners get a piece of the action. Um, and uh, this is all this is a shady area, but um, lawful. Well, and you get your budget. IPv4 and v6. Um, we support IPv4, and we're struggling to get IPv6 in there because our Japanese friends insist on it, and it's painful, but we have no choice. Um, they're dead serious about it. Can we start running SML procedures to influence some of those functions? How much does it slow down the box? Um, so the more it depends, but um, a lot of those building blocks, you don't need to write SML for. You have APIs, and um, they're configurable. And you typically write SML um, either to create some new, um, the, the most uh, frequent use for SML is to create libraries for new protocols that come up. So Skype came out, we created a Skype library, we uploaded it to all our customers, and now they can track Skype. Um, and that doesn't slow the box that much. Yeah. What percentage of your boxes are actually being used in metering today? Um, um, or are you asking just metering? Uh, well, all of them are, are doing analyzing the net. Right. So metering to me means you're actually taking some action oh, on, on a packet um, basis or a message basis based on that. So again... Are you, are you at the monetizing level versus just monitoring them? Right. Are we controlling? And the answer is... Um, I'd say, again, almost all of them. And, and, but, but there's a cycle here, because some carriers know they just want to control the damn thing. They don't know exactly what the damn thing is, but they want to control it. Um, there are a lot of carriers who start out by saying, let's just look at it. And then a few weeks into the process, they say, um, we need to try out that control thing. So th there's a cycle where um, I'd say probably uh, at least 50% of them start with control day one. The other 50% um, get there a few weeks later. And then now we're starting to see this cycle of the first ones who analyze and control come up and actually try to roll out some, some tiered packages out there. Because yeah. the, the first two are just defensive. Um, yeah. The third is, is actually practically trying to generate. And what are they controlling today? Uh, predominantly just saying, um, here is a limit beyond which Got to be so that was going back to your one slide on that one. Mm -hmm. right. and, and they slow it down. They don't want to block it. Um, oh, they, they are mm -hmm. often um, careful up, upstream versus downstream, upload versus download, on net versus off net. Um, they want to move some of this peer to peer traffic um, from peak hours and shift it into the night where there's less of uh, interactive usage of the network. Um, stuff like that. And they set a limit. And we just enforce the limit. And how do they slow down? Um, so uh, in congestion, um, the, the, we've implemented the full DiffServe model, which is essentially um, has got an element called classifier in it. Um, but the DiffServe model doesn't say how you classify. It just says you've got important, less important, less important. Um, and we have a very smart classifier because we track the application. And so this queuing is, is the short answer. Um, we certainly drop packets when we need to, uh, but we have the intelligence um, not to drop the wrong packets, but to drop the right packets, so that it minimizes, it leverages some of the TCP window sizes, it, it minimizes um, free transmissions, um, and, um, and the overall effect.